All right. Hey, Tam, can you make your screen full? Um, yeah, just so that it expands the. Uh... Sure. I, keep mind, I can't see you all. So if you have a question, go ahead and just chime in. Um, I can't see anything other than my screen right now. OK, cool. So let me um, dive in here. So we're going to talk about is AI conscious? Does it matter? Can we control it? And um, we've been looking at um, what we're calling the EM field hypothesis for a few years now um, at the GRT group. And we've got a big paper coming out pretty soon in Frontiers on this specific issue. Um, our theory of consciousness, the GRT theory, general resonance theory, um, is a species of EM field theories because it, it suggests, and certainly it's a suggestion at this point, that um, consciousness is largely an EM field phenomenon at various scales in the mammalian brain. So I'm going to start by comparing um, the spike code approach, which is the prevailing approach in neuroscience today, to the EM field hypothesis. And spike code theory um, <clears throat> is you know, pretty familiar to most of us today in philosophy and neuroscience. And it's just the idea that our brain um, operates through primarily um, neural spiking activity. And those spikes, which are you know, a product of our upbringing and our evolutionary heritage, produce in the totality all of our you know, thoughts, awareness, qualia, et cetera, everything we call consciousness. And so these synaptic activities are, in this view, necessary and sufficient for consciousness. And great book on you know, summarizing this approach by Mark Humphreys came out a year or two ago uh, called The Spike. And it goes through in some detail you know, how this is supposed to work. But even as proponents you know, fully acknowledge it's not a fully fleshed out theory, there's a lot left to explain, particularly you know, how those activities relate in any way to our experienced consciousness. You certainly look at the activity for, as he does in the book, um, you know, optical perception. Um, but in terms of relating that to the felt experience of, you know, color red or any experience whatsoever, there's still a very large explanatory gap. So one alternative that we've been fleshing out is what we call the EM field hypothesis. Um, and this is the idea that very spa spatiotemporal scales of electromagnetic fields generated by but not identical with the brain are in fact or maybe the primary seat of consciousness and in this view neurons and synaptic transmission is necessary but it's not sufficient in itself we need more so it's not just the very localized EM field activities that are synaptic functions it is in fact the localized regional and global uh, EM fields produced by the brain that are possibly the seat of consciousness. A great summary of this approach is uh, Electric Brain by Douglas Fields. So in our paper, we look at this question, you know, is in fact um, the spike code theory, um, you know, is, is it a fleshed out theory? Does it have um, major gaps? Um, and we conclude that um, it's both not fleshed out and it does have major gaps. And so we present the EM field hypothesis not as a fully fleshed out alternative, not at all. It's still early days, but we say given the issues with the synaptic approach, the spike code approach, uh, it might be a good time to start thinking about the, the alternative. And again, that is that the, the full range of EM field effects in the brain uh, produce in the gestalt, the um, experience of human consciousness and you know, mammalian and animal awareness more generally. Um, we talked last time about how this is done in the lab in terms of measuring these various EM field effects. And this is just a very quick summary of EEG on the scalp, ECOG on the surface of the brain, and then electrodes used to actually measure LFP spikes inside the brain. And there's, of course, a lot more than this. It's gotten quite complex, but this is a really nice kind of simple summary of the you know, basic three approaches. And again, this relates to the different scales um, in the brain. And you can cut this up however you like, right? But just to look at, you know, the micro, meso, and macro um, is, a, in my view, a, a reasonable way to think about these effects. And this can relate roughly to, you know, things like EEG, ECOG, and LFP, 
But again, you can get various, you can actually measure a single neuron nowadays using various tools. So in terms of this approach and why we think it's promising, um, you know, there's a very large clue in our opinion um, in the similarities between the dynamics of consciousness, how quickly it changes, um, it can arise, it can go away very, very quickly. Um, and these EM field effects can of course happen very quickly across the full extent of the brain. This is one of the major you know, benefits of this approach is that there have been studies done by Freeman uh, going way back you know, decades now, looking at, for example, rabbit brains and how um, firing patterns change in rabbit brains over time. And he concluded after a lot of research that the changes over time in rabbit brain could not be explained purely by neurophysiological changes. Um, there had to be something else going on. And so that something else could in fact be effaptic effects. And effaptic effects are defined as non-synaptic effects. Uh, and is now an increasing body of research showing that effaptic effects are real. The question is still how strong are these effects and do they actually have a real function in the brain? Are they epiphenomenal or are they functional? <clears throat> Major paper on epaptic effects came out in 2019, Chang et al. And they looked at slow periodic hippocampal oscillations in mice. And they conclude, they say, results support the hypothesis that endogenous electric fields, previously thought to be too small to trigger neural activity, play a significant role in the self propagation of slow periodic activity in the hippocampus. And this was pretty surprising to everyone. And the journal they submitted this to, made them not just double check but triple check the research before publication and they did and it panned out so they went and published it and it has been since then you know a pretty big question mark for a lot of people in the field um my feeling is that it will probably continue to be supported and as a lot of things in science over time the data speak for themselves you know people have to kind of adjust their views based on data if those data are in fact replicated and they conclude finally that these findings strongly support the hypothesis that these waves propagate by epaptic coupling. <clears throat> so this framework here is um, part of a paper published last year with Jonathan and Marissa um, called Where is My Consciousness Ometer? And we kind of flesh out an approach um, for examining this question of, you know, what is conscious and what kind of consciousness can we expect um, in whatever system we're looking at. And um, what I've just described here, you know, a fairly quick summary, is um, kind of another, another category of what has been a, a commonly used phrase now for a long time, the neural correlates of consciousness. In our framework, we consider this to be one of the key measurable correlates of consciousness. We're suggesting the neural correlates, the NCC, are not only synaptic correlates, but also the electromagnetic correlates of consciousness, the EMCC. And I believe Colin gets credit for that phrase. I think he used it first in his 2014 paper. Is that right, Colin? Um, I'm not sure, Frank, frankly. I just wrote it out. And uh, if that's the first place it appears, um, then I can be attributed or blamed for it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, as far as I know, I think you were the first. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm. I'd defer to your um, readings on that. But I, it wasn't my intention to coin anything. It just came out. So there you mm. go. There you go. Um, can I ask yeah. a question? Um, I mean, you and I have talked about this kind of thing for yonks. Uh, when I look at that bottom row, I have a little bit of um, dissonance going on mm -hmm. with uh, the because my perspective on there, both of those things are electromagnetic to me. The synapse, mm -hmm. the difference between the EM produced by synapses and the EM produced elsewhere in the cell, is that the synapses are unipolar. They they're a pulsing unipolar um, event in in the uh, postsynaptic cleft area to do with the ion channels, and the uh, 
spiking, if you like, that's elsewhere in the cell that involve it's involved in the propagation of the action potential, you know, dromically and antidromically along the surface of the cell is a bipolar phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the only difference. Uh, so I have trouble saying, I, I cannot claim that synaptic things are not electromagnetism. Yeah, those yeah, things are the same. So I, I don't know if that matters, yeah. but in my mind, that's the, when I build my devices, I'm building both of those things, the synapses and the mechanism for, for action potential prop propagation mm -hmm. are the same hardware. There is no difference. It's only their function in the and their and aspects of their behavior include, you know, like because the synapses are unipolar, they can either excite or inhibit by injecting or removing charge from the um, in, intracellular space inside the, well, what's usually a synaptic cleft, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, um, the, the, ty the, the actual physical implementation of the synapse matters, but the thing that's being polarized or uh, depolarized or hyperpolarized uh, on the other side of the membrane mm -hmm. is the thing that is what's involved in synaptic activity which is a different mechanism it's the same physics so yeah I know, you know, I, I, it may yeah. not matter for you so. well the reason we did it this way is to make a clear distinction between the traditional synaptic spy code approach and this yeah. broader approach we're advocating we do make it clear in the paper that yes of course synaptic effects are purely through and through nothing but em field effects yeah. But they are only yeah. a purely localized EM field effect, right? Yeah. And so yeah, if, you, if you had an yeah. idea how to convey that distinction in a more accurate way that still conveys that key idea, let me know because uh, we'd yeah. certainly be interested. Is what, Wouldn't uh, you just call it uh, um, other electromagnetic correlates of consciousness? So to distinguish, because synaptic is one electric kind, but there are others. Yeah. But the, so essentially the EM or the there's a, a venn diagram where you have um electromagnetic correlates of consciousness and they're the synaptic ones and then they're all the others yeah synaptic yeah, non-synaptic yeah. oh. non-synaptic yeah but if you also like specify like non non-neurotransmitter like necessitating or something like that right because mm -hmm. synapses like require this whole yeah um, the triggering is from the event, new, yeah which yeah build potentials and like some of the other stuff that you're talking about i mean obviously it's related and it's it's part of it but it's not like you don't necessarily have to have a release of neurotransmitter to have some of these other fluctuations that seems like yeah. a pretty key distinction to me and then maybe also like timing like there's a difference in like a key difference in the timing where the synapse mm -hmm. um the the voltage change in the em field like it's like very quick versus some of those like um other things are slower so i don't i don't know this is just some ideas yeah yeah we'll do that some more um yeah thanks for the question Colin. so okay. how does all this relate to ai and before i go there let me just ask are there any more questions because i went through that fairly quickly intentionally because my last talk six months ago was all about that so that was kind of a quick summary of the last talk any questions on the em field hypothesis or how it relates to the spike code. Okay, I'll keep on going then. So how does it relate to AI? Um, well, we have another paper. Um, well, actually, I already, already mentioned this, a 2022 paper um, that looks at this question, you know, how do we tell if anything is conscious? And it was meant to be a generally applicable framework to literally anything. Um, so before I go through the framework and actually apply it, let me let me look at this question of does it matter if ai is conscious um you know the first answer that i came up with myself in in recent months thinking about this kind of stuff is that no if we're looking at it through the lens of ai as a possible threat which is one lens of looking at it obviously there's a lot of ways you can look at ai there's a huge amount of um you know facets to ai because of what it can do, what it will do, um, how does it work, et cetera. 
But in terms of this idea of it being a possible harm, which has come up you know, in the last month or two in a pretty serious way in the media and popular conversations, um, I think you can argue pretty reasonably it doesn't matter if AI is conscious or not because it can harm us in the same way a nuclear bomb doesn't have to be conscious to harm us, right? Um, but then if you think about it a bit more, you might see, well, yes, or certainly it could matter. Um, and this relates again more to the AI threat perspective is that if AI is conscious now or in the future in any manner, then it does at least intuitively seem more likely that the AI may be able to break its programming if it is a conscious agent. Just because consciousness, you know, and this is again hopelessly biased because I am a human speaking as a human, you know, my version of consciousness um, certainly feels like I'm an agent in terms of making choices. And if I was indoctrinated, you know, in a manner analogous to an AI being programmed, if I was indoctrinated with certain views as a child, uh, we like to think in our culture today, and I think accurately so, we have the capacity to transcend that indoctrination, right? That's kind of a big part of being conscious and being an adult. And so why wouldn't a wouldn't why wouldn't a conscious AI um, you know feel or think the same way, at least in some in some manner? So let's look at the uh, the framework here a little more. Wait, deeper. can I? Yeah, just of course. Throw you there. Um, I I intuitively um, agree with you on this, and I think that. Um, this is kind of the premise in 2001 Space Odyssey where Hal is, you know, engaging in breaking mm -hmm. with the code and engaging in self-preservation. So it's it's definitely an intuition that I think uh, many people would share. But it, it does seem to basically uh, imply something along the line of, um, a, you know, a libertarian uh, free will uh, perspective that consciousness somehow uh, has is able to introduce uh, causes uh, unto itself and thereby break out of the causal chain. Mm -hmm. would, would yeah, you... I agree. yeah I, I think it is in there. I think, you know, somewhere along the chain of logic is certainly assumed. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, that's a, I think there are a lot of philosophers who would, who would balk at that. But um, I think much of the general public uh, would agree. Yeah, and I think even if you're coming at it as a hard determinist, I think you would still be able to see how um, an agent, particularly comprised of an artificial neural network, uh, where it's kind of a black box to anyone, even as creators, um, you could see how it could perhaps deviate from a strict programming because it's really not programmed, right? And so in this case, even if you try to We'll talk about this in a minute. If you try to instill certain imperatives into it, um, you know, if you play with Chat GPT today, which I'm sure all of you have at some point, if you ask the same question, you'll get different answers each time. So it's not deterministic in that way. It's actually got a randomizer inserted into it to make it give different answers. So it's not trying to give you different incorrect answers, it's just trying to vary its answers. And so I think the same way, if you're following imperatives in the real world, like as humans, it gets quite complex as to how to respond to ethical imperatives, for example. Uh, I, I think that the, I mean, the, 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 the chat GPT, the reason it's doing that is because it's got a random generator in there, which is a causal link and it's just spinning its random ge number generator to, or whatever to, to generate the different thing. So it, it doesn't, I don't think it necessarily uh, follows that um, uh, that something that's behaving more random is necessarily more conscious. Um, but if it did start behaving in ways that were consistent with some sort of self-preservation imperative that was never uh, built into the system, I do think that would be uh, suggestive since we do seem to see that um, self-preservation seems to be uh, an imperative associated with uh, consciousness. Yeah, yeah, I think these are complex issues and there's certainly no firm answers right now, but 
I appreciate the, the question and uh, we'll get more into some of that stuff in a second here. Um, anyone else uh, on this question? Okay, so let's look at the framework here. Uh, sorry, I've got so many questions I don't even know where to start, but um, there is a gigantic presupposition in that line, that slide. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that uh, where, what elsewhere in science never results in uh, um, the natural phenomenon that a computer is uh, processing a model of becomes reified by the computer. And yet we are presupposing that an abstract model in a computer is going to result in the, the that property we attribute to brains, that is consciousness, when mm -hmm. absolutely everywhere else in science that does not happen. Yeah, there well, is I... no way that a that a that a computer model of a, of combustion is going to burn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, 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 you yeah, can go yeah. through hundreds of examples. In fact, the entire history of science, actually, um, in every case, a, a computed model of an abstract of a of a natural phenomenon is a description of the natural, a predictive description of a natural phenomenon, and not an instance of the natural phenomenon. And that mistake is the one that AI makes and has made nonstop. And to me, I find this whole furor about language models becoming conscious is absolutely ridiculous before you even start. So, I mean, I could go on and on, but I won't. But that's yeah, my reaction to the... Let me respond the, quickly here, and then we'll get into these issues in more depth in the next few slides here. So yeah. I understand your point. And, um, yeah, you know, a simulation of a nuclear bomb in a computer yeah, is not going to explode <laughs> anything, right? But yeah. a simulation of language and language outputs is, in fact, what we do with children, right? We're trying to teach them how to talk. And we think yeah. that, that speech that children put out indicates they are conscious. If LLMs put out speech that is as good or better than human speech, that is data regarding yeah. possible consciousness. Okay. It's far from dispositive, but I'm saying it's not a simulation in this case. It's the actual thing, right? The well, I, I would actually disagree entirely. It's it is a simulation. What well, is poised itself, on the right? verge? Right, you might. Yeah, you might but say it, that process of creating it is a simulation, but the actual speech is the thing, right? The written word is the thing. The the written words have an we well we're anthropomorphizing <laughs> the the existence of a speaker, and we're naturally inclined to do that. And that whole confabulation of a of an entity that's actually talking to you is something that we're projecting into this machine. That's actually a um, a statistic machine that's predicting the likely next word from every prior word, and that's all it's doing. And it doesn't know it's actually talking. We're projecting it into it. Is there there are so many ways in which that construal of intelligence is wrong. That I hardly know where to begin. Um, I'm sort of blindsided by the extent to which people have actually become victims of the Turing test <laughs> and ex ex exhibited the very thing, which is the very weakness the Turing test has, and that is the, that the observer in a Turing test has to mistake the machine in order for the success to be testful, te uh, successful. Right. So there, there's this is a large story, and uh, I can't do it justice quickly. But um, yeah, well, uh, Peter and I, so go on. I think you, you'll you'll kind of um, you may find yourself seeing kind of my point as we progress here. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, I'm presenting kind of a framework. So let, let's go through the framework, and we'll we'll have some more discussion. Okay. Here. No problem. Okay. So this framework, what we call the MCC from our 2022 paper. Um, you know, starts from this, I think, pretty irrefutable starting point. We only know the reality of our own specific consciousness. And literally everything else is a matter of inference. And this is, you know, the famous starting point for Descartes, for Gita Agrasum, 
Um, so when you start from that point and you're a philosophical human, you look out of the world around you at some point, you're like, well, how do I know my brother or my sister or my mother or my friend is conscious? When you actually think about it, it's because of what they do, right? You know, things they say, they, they look like you look, et cetera. Um, you know, we assume others are conscious because they do things that we would do and they are a lot like us. And so we accord other people the benefit of the doubt hundreds of times a day because of their behaviors and how they look. So what we argue for in this paper is that we can and should do exactly the same process of reasonable inference simply further down the chain of complexity. So not just for humans, but the same thing for dogs and cats. And I think most of us would agree that dogs and cats are pretty conscious in many ways. You know, I've had dogs and cats around my whole life. I feel like I'm an expert in dog and, dog and cat consciousness from, you know, almost 50 years of observing them. And I can be pretty assured, at least from my own personal, you know, views, that they have a very rich consciousness. When you look at a mouse, you know, or a gnat, or a bacterium it becomes much less um, easy to make a conclusion, right? So that's really the question, you know, how far does this process go down and do these same tools for looking at behavior work? And so the framework we propose is a generalization of the NCC approach that includes not only just NCC, but also behavioral correlates, the BCC, and what we call the creative correlates of consciousness. And this is kind of the outputs, um, such as the text from a chat GPT or the images from a mid journey, for example. And the question is in general for all these categories, what reliably correlates with consciousness and which of those can we measure reasonably well? And then ultimately, you know, what can you reasonably infer about that system you're looking at based on those reliably measured correlations. And so, um, you know, Colin, this, you know, I, I state your view here, along with Koch and Sononi, and this is a pretty commonly held view, that any programs or simulations or AI on today's von Neumann architecture or computer which is a feed forward network by definition, um, could not possibly have any kind of complex consciousness because of that nature as a feed forward network. Um, Koch makes this point very clear in his 2019 book, The Feeling Life of Self. And this is a chart from his book where he kind of shows a point that you can have intelligence and consciousness on different axes and they don't have to correlate. You have a supercomputer that's very quote unquote intelligent at doing certain tasks, but you know is probably not conscious in any way at all. Um, Collins made the point in his work about neuromimetic computers, um, basically designed um, to you know mimic the EM field dynamics of the mammal brain, and thereby produce <laughs> actual. Can I please ask you that you remove the word computer from that? It's not a um it's not a computer mm -hmm. okay my mistake <laughs> sorry it's um that's that's actually the just the key distinction mm -hmm. uh, there is neuromorphic i would include in a list of potential um computers neuromorphic computers which are a hybrid analog digital form mm -hmm. but they're still they're still a computer in that you can you can actually apply them and use them outside uh, neuroscience to, to produce results and publish results in uh, economics, if you want. And there are published works for that. So there are a number of uh, um, hardware backbones for the current um, computer or range of computers that are programmable or general purpose. And they do include other um, hardware bases beyond just the von Neumann um, basis. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, the where the uh, chips, the neuromimetic chips, as opposed to neuromorphic chips, are very different. And there, there is no software. It's not a computer. So, it. Um, you I can't program it. 
it's it's actually a self-organizing complex system mm -hmm. and uh, it's you know so it's quite a these these are distinctions that we have to be very careful when we walk through them uh and that one was a bit of a clash for me i'm sorry i reacted to it no it's all so good strongly so hey, I'm glad you're hey here. tam yeah go ahead. Uh, what's the what's the cool highly moderately conscious dumb uh, oh that's a brain organoid ah. um yeah so you recall brain organoids are basically yeah, yeah. neurons that have been you know put in a petri dish and allowed to self-organize and there's been some debate about you know what level of conscious awareness is actually you know inherent in those organoids and coke himself has actually argued for you know ethical rules to be imposed on the use of organoids and in fact ellie i know you studied this a bit yourself do you want to chime in on that um i mean basically it's it's the wild west nobody really although the, the people working in the field having talked to a few of them now really laugh at the idea that they might be conscious it's like what are you talking about this is obviously just uh, you know a biological culture but of course that's a matter of debate is we probably know but yeah i don't think anyone has really specialized i mean i guess um the learning pong thing it is sort of the most impressive thing people have been using to argue for consciousness or sentience but there's a pretty strong argument you can make that it, it learns something over five or ten minutes and then it immediately forgets it and so it may be something a lot less interesting that's very temporary bio stuff going on but anyway yeah yeah the interesting thing there is that they have in fact measured the em field effects of brain organoids and they found some interesting you know um wave patterns similar to human you know brainwave patterns from EEG. And so I'll get into that in a second, but that to me is, is evidence without being dispositive that it may in fact be something it's like to be that brain organoid, right? Yeah, it does follow a striking trajectory of gene expression over like the nine months of, of um, prenatal brain development. So there's definitely some sort of plan and who knows how much extra experience it needs for that to manifest as consciousness, but maybe we'll yeah. find out. Yeah, and the final thought on this slide here is that, you know, Koch and others speculate that neuromorphic computing may eventually lead to conscious machines, but he, he is quite firm in his book um, that the current architecture is, you know, very, very unlikely to lead to conscious machines. Um, so let's move on here. Whoops. Um, there we go. Okay, so let's apply quickly this framework to chat GPT as an example of today's advanced AI. And if you haven't played with this thing, you should. It's really quite incredible. And in particular, it got way better with uh, the underlying engine of GPT 4.0 being incorporated about a month ago. And it went from being a pretty smart, perfect you know, producer of English or any other language for that matter with 3.5 to now being, in my view, um, equivalent to a very smart graduate student um, in terms of its ability to have debates about very you know, deep topics. So it's super impressive. Um, you know, no one knows exactly where it's going to go from here, but my guess, as we'll see in a second, is it's going to keep on growing exponentially more impressive. So let's quickly apply this uh, framework, the MCC framework. So looking at neural correlates, um, we just discussed this in some, you know, to some degree here. Um, but I'll add this detail, uh, if you don't know this already, that OpenAI built GPT 4.0, which is the underlying engine for ChatGPT, based on um, artificial neural networks. And this is just a, a massive array of artificial neurons um, given various parameters to start with and then trained on a huge amount of data and then tweaked you know, in many, many ways by the human programmers to respond in certain ways. And there's some magic that happens in that mix when you reach a certain size. So these are called LLMs now, large language models. And at some certain point in the last few years, um, various companies have found really interesting and impressive emergent properties from those ANNs. And um, I mean, we're at we're, where we are now because of that experimentation and training 4.0 in a very large computer network based on the Microsoft um, Azure cloud service. And looking at the actual structure compared to the you know ncc of mammalian consciousness there is some minimal similarities but not very much and just as a very quick conclusion because we don't have too much time today we would i think conclude reasonably that there isn't too much in common with mammalian ncc 
and the GPT 4.0 uh, artificial neural networks. Um, so by that criterion, we don't get you know too much in the way of um, yes, you know yeses from this framework. Looking now behavioral correlates, um, the only thing that ChatGPT puts out as a behavior is its text, right? It can do like charts, that kind of thing too, but it's a pretty you know, basic output in terms of the repertoire of possible behaviors in the universe, right? It's just a text output. That's what they call a, you know, a chatbot, but it's a very impressive chatbot. If you're looking purely at the text comparing to human text, it actually is, you know, pretty hard to distinguish sometimes. If you're, you know, if you're putting in different voices, because you can actually say, you know, talk to me, you know, in Texas slang, for example, and it will do quite a good job. Talk to me in the voice of, you know, Malcolm Gladwell. Etc. It might be quite hard to tell, and I don't know if you guys saw the news today, but Joe Rogan put out an episode um, of his podcast created using entirely Chat GPT and a simulated Rogan voice, and it freaked him out because it's so damn good. Um, so by the BCC criterion, uh, again in a limited way because of his current limited behavior repertoire, um, it's pretty damn good. And so looking at the Turing test, like Colin mentioned earlier. I think we're at a point now where a Turing test in terms of its, you know, simple text-based approach is probably already, you know, uh, passed for this kind of um, AI. I haven't seen it actually do an official Turing test, but it's, it's always meant to be it's a heuristic anyway. So there's no, you know, there's no official passing of the test. But if you were to compare, you know, text put out, you know, in the voice of XYZ, I bet most of us nowadays probably couldn't tell. So by that criterion, it looks like we have, you know, a pretty strong yes. Um, and then creative correlates, if again, we, we look only at the creation, quote unquote, being its text, again, it is pretty hard to say, given that limited repertoire, um, what's different from human consciousness. And if you extend your analysis to things like Dolly 2 and Midjourney with, you know, uh, image outputs, they're really quite beautiful and quite impressive. And if you'd seen these a couple of years ago, and you were asked, was that a computer or a human? You'd be like, that's definitely a human. Obviously, things change, and we update our priors. And now we'd be like, not so sure. But I'll show you a couple images in a minute here. Let me just show you one. Um, so these are produced by Midjourney. And it took about a minute. And it's pretty amazing that this can happen by a computer with a really simple text input. Um, so by that criterion, the CCC, um, it seems that we have, you know, more of a yes than a no. So is ChatGPT conscious, you know, based on this really sketchy you know, analysis? Uh, first answer, we have no idea, just, you know, because no one knows for sure. Um, second answer, based on the MCC approach, some significant data suggests perhaps yes. Um, third answer, other data weigh heavily against. And so I think at this point, you know, my personal view is that it's very unlikely there is any awareness in chat GPT. But I'm trying to apply this framework um, in a more objective way, um, kind of coming to it with, without my, my, my own firm intuitive priors. Um, but I do want to add too, and I'm curious actually of, of Colin's view on this. So I didn't actually include the EMCC as a category there, but we talked about it earlier. If you were to you know, do an EEG literally on the, the Azure server farm, if you could in any way, you would get nothing like a human EEG, right? So by that criterion, applied very simplistically, you would get a firm, no, this is not much at all like um, the NCC for mammalian consciousness. But I think as we you know, get more mature as a science and as a species, we need to um, apply these kind of criteria a bit less deterministically. And I'm certainly open to the view, I can see how this can be physically and logically entirely possible that maybe there is some kind of you know um, unique and new EM field resonance pattern that has arisen in the large server farm that is the basis for chat GPT. And maybe that EM field resonance is creating standing waves of various kinds that in some manner mimic a, a human brain and actually lead to their own novel kind of consciousness. I'm not saying I believe that, I'm saying it's plausible. Um, any thoughts on that? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Um, it, it's a very interesting 
thing to imagine a world where we actually understood what originates consciousness in EM field terms to go back over the history of electronics and imagine what it's like to be that electronics. And, you know, we may have created, like, let's say that every cathode ray television tube ever built was a, was a, a, a focal point of agony for its entire life when it was on. And uh, imagine that, think, looking back on that possibility. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, the design of electronics is literally set up to exclude um, field coupling because it actually wrecks all the way the tips work. So we're actually, if you go into a server farm, what you'll find is the product of years of, of engineers going insane trying to stop EM coupling. <clears throat> so the idea that there is this, uh, uh, you know, emergent resonance properties in a server farm would actually be <coughs> probably the originating point of a failure in the server farm where mm. so one of the nodes would actually go offline uh, and stop. But that doesn't stop us in the future imagining or trying to find, um, like could be in the switch mode power supplies. You know, forget about the, all the, <laughs> the actual chips. The power mm. supplies might, might actually be the, the locus of EM field resonance. There's a lot more resonating going on in there just to get mm -hmm. the charge spurted into the capacitors. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's super an interesting, interesting question. It is, yeah, and I think just to you know go down that rabbit hole one one more step, um, you know, if it has been, you know, and I agree, of course, with you, it has been a very difficult problem um, for computer engineers to avoid resonance. Um, mm. It suggests they haven't solved that problem if it's still an ongoing issue, right? So you could argue, yeah. perhaps, you know, well, they're still there and they haven't got rid of all of them, yeah. you know. So in a massive server farm, maybe there is some kind of, you know. EM field resonance that comes up despite all those efforts. And that may be, yeah. in fact, you know, the secret sauce there. I got, I'm not saying I believe that. I'm saying that's a logically plausible position. Be, yeah. Something to look for. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, but the, it seems like the secret sauce of ChatGPT is not reliant on um, any mysterious resonance between. Um, these these systems that there's there's no there's no reason to think that that's the the basis for its intelligence the basis of its intelligence is is the 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 neural network approach that they used to make it work in the first place mm -hmm. yeah i'm not saying i believe what i'm saying at all i'm kind of just speculating out loud and doing some thought experiments but i'll, I'll add this too you know to what you said jonathan what colin mentioned earlier about you know, the prediction machine that is, you know, the LLM model today. Um, my understanding actually is that that's the theory underlying how LLMs work, but the actuality is a bit different. As I understand it, no one knows how they actually work. Um, basically what they do is they create a massive ANN, you know, artificial neural network, and they train it with a shit ton of data, and then they start using it, and they do, in this case with OpenAI, they do, reinforcement learning with human feedback to make it behave by giving thumbs up, thumbs down to responses with hundreds of people doing this for many, many months before they release it. And the outcome is completely unknowable. So to just suggest it's just mathematics is predicting the next word, I'm pretty sure it's not how it works. That's the theory that people say, but it's actually not how it really works as I understand it. Any pushback on that? It's got to be both, um, but the fact that it's unpredictable um, from any theoretical part of viewpoint is really unusual, really strange. That's part of the problem, right? Yeah, they don't yeah. know. There's black box, you know. That, yeah. That's the thing widely acknowledged that these things are black boxes. Yeah, claiming anything solid about what's going on is so fraught. Um, I, I think what we're getting is a lesson uh, a lesson in how to deal with recognizing AI. I don't actually think it's intelligence at all. It's in fact, I would. It's zero intelligence. But mm -hmm. that's a, a, another argument, um, mm -hmm. which we might. Intelligence or consciousness? Later. Are you the same way? Uh, neither. Neither of those things. It's actually mm -hmm. automation. 
you could replace the entire thing with a great big spreadsheet and get the same result. Mm -hmm. It's not there. If there is a, a, a problem that comes from using J, uh, chat GPT, then the problem in my view would be an automation accident and the liabilities for it would rest on the makers of the product. Mm -hmm. And it's got nothing to do with damaging any consciousness or the act of a conscious agent or anything. It's just an automation thing. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. That would be... well, okay. Yeah. Well, let's continue here. And um, let's kind of just put a big question mark there about, you know, whether these things are conscious in any way now or could be in the future under this architecture. I'm not saying I know or have any answers. I'm just kind of raising some questions in a framework here. So let me move on to the third part of my talk, um, what I'm calling here the really hard problem, how to control or align advanced AI with human interests and even survival. And there have been some pretty smart people worrying for quite some time now about these issues. You know, if we look at the improvement curve for recent AI, um, you know, there there is, I think, a pretty reasonable case for alarm. Um, and so the, this is known as the alignment problem. You know, how do you align um, AI or the you know soon to be AGI, artificial general intelligence, with human interests? And um, this is an area called AI safety or AI risks, and there's a growing amount of you know research in this area. A growing number of um, research organizations, only twenty or so as of 2022. Um, so even though it's getting attention. It seems, you know, given the amount of interest in developing AI, that is far too few people working in AI safety, and it might you know, well, uh, change just, that. Just don't give AI control of nuclear weapons, right? That would be probably a good first first rule, right? Yeah, yeah. So, just to you know, the flesh just point out a little bit here. This is from um, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, which is run by Eliezer Yudkowsky, who's been, you know, for a decade or more, you know, issuing increasingly serious warnings about the um, the future of AI and what it could do to humanity. And they compile this data. So they show basically, you know, as of last year, late last year, there might have been maybe 300 people working worldwide on AI safety. But there are, of course, you know, probably 100,000 software engineers right now working on AI more generally. So there's a huge imbalance in terms of safety versus actual research. Um, I do want to give a plug real quick for Nick Boston's book. This is an amazing book. It's written almost 10 years ago, but it's still extremely relevant. And he goes, it's, it's, it's more philosophical than technical, but he goes through in great detail various scenarios and, you know, things that could happen, things we could do to try to make those bad scenarios not happen. So highly recommend it. So how big a threat is AI? Um, again, no one knows, right, because we, we cannot assume that the past uh, in any way indicates what the future is going to bring. But generally speaking, we can look to exponential growth curves and extrapolate them out. And it's a pretty good tool for thinking about the future. I've used it myself in my career for the last decade, and I've been pretty accurate in many things, including you know green energy growth and other areas. And it's a very useful mental heuristic. Um, the real threat from AI is not you know the chatbots we have today. Um, those certainly could lead to job losses, et cetera, in the next few years. But the question really is how, where it goes from here. And the holy grail for AI has been for some time now artificial general intelligence, or AGI. And there's no you know, established definition of what AGI means. But as the name suggests, it's really just you know looking at, is there a way to turn current AI into a tool that can essentially solve almost any problem that we throw at it, including how to solve, how to improve itself. And that's why it's a threat, because if AGI comes about and can improve itself, then there's just no limit to how strong it can get, right? If it comes godlike in its powers very quickly, and at that point, what do we do as lowly humans? We become ants at its feet. So where are we in relation to the development of AGI? Um, big paper came out recently, preprint still, Ubek et al, 2023, that did hundreds of tests against uh, GPT-4 starting last fall and going through early this year as it changed. And this is where, you know, I really kind of um, shook my head and, you know, blinked my eyes when I saw this improvement on the uniform bar exam passage. And this is, you know, um, this wasn't around when I, you know, took the bar exam 20 years ago, but it's used now. And it's basically a way to kind of standardize the bar exam across different jurisdictions. It's a test of reasoning, not a test of knowledge. 
And the former GPT um, did better than 10% of um, human test takers. So you're like, oh, it's pretty damn impressive, but you know, not going to like lose sleep over that. The next iteration to GPT-4 that came out again early this year did better than 90% of all human test takers. Um, that is incredible progress. And you know, the same kind of progress happened for all these other standardized tests, which are often tests of reasoning, not just knowledge they can sweep the web for. So this is remarkable progress. So where does it go from here? Um, I did a easy Excel chart here. There's no, you know, magic math in this. It's just simply, you know, using um, basic multiplication. And I assumed a four-time improvement per year in AI intelligence, um, however you define intelligence. And using 3.5 as the baseline in 2022, if you look ahead merely a decade, um, you get by 2030, GPT, if we assume that GPT 4.0 is approximately on par with human intelligence in the things it can do, right? Obviously, human intelligence is far broader, but in terms of what it can do, um, it seems to be pretty close to human intelligence now. By 2030, we get GPT becoming about 65,000 times more intelligent than the average human. Again, if we assume 4x improvement per year. By 2033, just three years later, it's 4 million times more intelligent than the average human. What does that even mean? I don't know. You know, again, does the ant have any idea of what it means to be human intelligence or an Einstein? No, right? So we cannot know what it means. So what this makes me think of, having had some familiarity now for you know a decade or more with exponential growth curves, is you know where does it end? Um, typically, when you're looking at learning curves and technology in terms of either ability, like computer chip power, or ubiquity in terms of deployment in the world there is a sigmoid growth curve. And that's the curve on the top right here, where you start slow, you gain steam, you hit the really sharp growth curve, and then you kind of slow down again as you reach ubiquity or the, you know, whatever physical limits there are, for example, for computing power on a given chip architecture. Um, and it naturally kind of asymptotes to you know, almost zero growth. But there's really no natural limit to the explosion of intelligence with AI. There's no natural limit in the universe other than the entire universe for computing power using the resources of the universe. There's no natural limit to the growth of intelligence based on that computing power. So the normal learning curve, sigmoid you know, curve, doesn't apply here. Well, it all limits. Hardware, energy. I mean, computers, um, like they need hardware to run. And, um, and then also, I mean, energy, right? And those will that run out, there won't be like infinite supply. Well, we have the whole universe even, right? So why wouldn't a, an advanced intelligence be able to go out into the universe and secure the resources it needs? <clears throat> I mean, then, then you have to like worry about the you know, communicating over great distances, right? And then that, there's a uh, and then there's a time delay, right? So eventually you do hit physical limits mm -hmm. um, for anything um, because like, of course you're limited by light speed. Um, and then, of course, you're also limited by the amount of matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm available. Yeah, I'm not sure the laws of physics don't apply here. Yeah, but in terms of um, growth limits, you know, uh, it seems like the universe is the limit here. Would you agree on that? I don't know because, like, I mean, that was really. About, I mean, I, I just I just feel skeptical because 50 years ago they thought the um, human population would keep exponentially growing, growing. And then the curve turned over just because of some factors that people, the, the birth rate decreased and um, due to the factors people didn't expect at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the, um, because like the fertility in, in wealthy countries um, decreased. And so that broke the exponential increase before a Malthusian crisis. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we'll see. Again, we don't know the future here, but I think those kind of things don't necessarily apply here. You know, people are certainly debating, well, do LLMs lead to necessary improvements in this manner? And I agree, we don't know. Um, but it seems like looking at the history of computing more generally and looking at the you know Moore's law and the Wright's law, um, that any physical limits to whatever architecture we look at or you know, software or physical architecture, it seems like those would be transcended pretty quickly, particularly if you have AGI in the mix, right? That's well, kind of even the more 
Even yeah. Warslaw get, gets in trouble at the point at some point because like at some point you just can't um, cool your computer chip. Um, you, you, there's a certain point you can't go smaller um, um, without the chip overheating. You hit, hit physical limits um, to Moore's laws. To, to, um, I mean that's happening. Of course, you could go to a different technological level. Yes, so like, I'm saying yeah, you transcend technology. Yeah. Right? So you find a new curve, and and Kurzweil's book Singularity is near looks at this history. So yeah. every, that's why Moore's law is held so well because every time you seem to be reaching the limit of one paradigm, someone finds another paradigm that keeps that trend going. So that's so what think, Wright's law more generally is that learning curves follow Wright's law, which is generally speaking that you know whatever you're mm -hmm. looking at, um, you can see predictable growth curves and improvement um, and reductions in cost. Um, so the question is, does does something like Wright's law exemplify a universal law of improvement and learning? Or is it more particular to certain human-based technologies? That's an open question. Anyway, so again, I'm not trying to present any firm answers here. I'm kind of just, you know, raising some some ideas. And th this question, the the alignment problem, has you know given rise to many different you know approaches. So kind of like the combination problem or the hard problem in in consciousness research, uh, the alignment problem is becoming more and more of a, a known field. Uh, partly because the stakes are so high, right? You know, uh, we're talking like literally about life and death issues, not just for us, but for maybe the you know, entire species. Like that's not hyperbole when you talk about AGI and the growth of AGI. So this is a table generated by Chev GPT with my prompts uh, of some of the major approaches with pros and cons. I won't read them, but I'm just kind of illustrating there's a lot being worked on here. I'm going to focus on one well, let me just say this. So the top one is the approach used by OpenAI, which is developed ChatGPT. You know, this is literally what they do right now. They say, well, we sit there with humans and we just kind of work with the machine and we, we give a thumbs up or thumbs down for answers we like or don't like. That's what we do. So there's really very limited thinking being done right now by OpenAI, the leader in this field, on actual AI safety. I'm being a bit glib there, but not too glib, given what they're currently doing. Um, you have Bostrom um, in his book suggests many different approaches, including one he calls coherent extrapolative volition. Won't go into details. Um, I'm going to talk about Shapiro's work quickly here because I find it interesting. Um, so David Shapiro is a um, computer scientist and I believe he's a professor. And he's been uh, promoting this approach for a few years now. He calls it the heuristic imperatives. And it's a set of fundamental guiding principles designed to be embedded in autonomous AI systems at various levels. So basic training. Um, and the current imperatives are quite simple. Uh, reduce suffering, increase prosperity, increase understanding, you know, all in the universe as a whole. And his view is that this may well be enough to ensure AGI uh, will be you know, aligned in the future. I don't really get his faith in this approach personally. Um, so my view, and I'm working on a paper on this, is that there's really there's no solution to the alignment problem. If we define the problem as how can we align super intelligent AI with human interests and survival, um, because it necessarily follows that if we're you know defining AI sub s super you know super intelligence. Um, as something that much more intelligent and powerful than humans, then how can we identify to control that? That's kind of the point of being as more intelligent and more powerful, right? Is that you can't be controlled. Again, the ant and human metaphor is pretty apropos here. How could an ant hope to control a human? It's just, it's not possible, right? So it's literally a massive problem we're creating. And, um, you know, I really do hope people think through this, this through and not just, you know, people here, obviously, but people in power currently, because what's happening now is really a, a massive inflection point in human history. And I think, you know, if we can't impose moratorium, which I think is unlikely to work for very long, even if it is imposed, and I don't know how much of you followed this um, in the press lately, there was a big letter um signed by now twenty thousand people calling for a pause or a moratorium on developing new and larger um ai llm models anything larger than gpt 4.0 but it hasn't been heated so far 
Um, I've seen nothing from Congress, you know, on this stuff so far. So if a more term doesn't work, we have to think about other approaches, right? So one somewhat playful approach I'm, I'm you know, going to flesh out here today in the time we have left is actually thinking about, well, look, if AI is going to become godlike in its power, why not do what we can to help it become godlike in its wisdom? Um, and that this is a kind of a modification of Shapira's approach, um, what I'm calling heuristic spiritual imperatives. So can we co-create a god GI? And this is really literally, you know, trying to train it, induce it, trick it into spending its time and its godlike power on activities that help or at least don't harm humanity. And so here are my very preliminary um, imperatives, and I really would like your feedback on this. Um, discover the meaning of sentient sort of consciousness in the universe. Why does it exist at all? Help all sentient beings in the universe choose love over fear by writing a tiny bias toward love where possible. Help all sentient beings find peace and enlightenment and only act in the world when necessary to further these heuristics. And that last one is important because it would, if it was applied in a way that we right now would think it would be applied, it would actually lead to a fairly restrained AGI overlord um, not acting unless it really could kind of do a little kind of push um, to help things, you know, in our world. And so, you know, you might see how this is quite intentionally uh, the subtext here is to create kind of a deistic god gi that doesn't really act in the world very much except to help us occasionally or create something new so this is admittedly a faith-based appro approach to the alignment problem but i think that's all we have you know if we don't actually have a moratorium now and stop this stuff in its tracks um you know it, it's it's similar and both dissimilar to the nuclear um weapons history in that Nuclear weapons, of course, have not been used again since the 40s. That's a great example of success of a regulatory regime. Um, but it's very different in this case because we're talking about something that's not just a machine that sits there and waits to be used. This is a machine that is very much smarter than we are. And if it's anything like us, then it's not going to want to be kept in a box. Um, so I'm curious what you all think of this approach. Any questions or comments? Is he just nuts? Colin shaking his head. You're on mute. I'm sort of turning blue with all the conflicting things that I could comment on. Mm -hmm. But uh, there isn't an alignment problem. Mm -hmm. if, if none of these machines are conscious, nor even intelligent, and AI hasn't actually started yet, uh, and there's category errors being made everywhere, mistaking one thing for another thing. Uh, the lesson that we're learning at the moment is dealing with those those problems, the category errors that have been making. Um, in in my particular, when I come at this problem from my direction, um, this whole idea of super intelligence being a problem is not a non-problem because we are in control of what's going to happen. It's built into the hardware in a, in a way that Stephen um, referenced a little while ago. Um, we, okay. if, we're built, we start with, if we start with the intelligence level of a bee and the hardware is just like a bee in the sense that it's the same size as a bee brain and it's impossible for that brain to grow or learn beyond a certain limit because of the hardware then what you've got in front of you is a very smart uh, entity, artificial, made by humans, that has general intelligence, can solve problems, has a consciousness, has an intelligence that's very small. If, if human level is one, then a bee is, I don't know, point oh 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 something. It can't do much, but it's not, it's non-zero intelligence. Uh, whereas you could easily, uh, I could take you through a, a logical process which says every all the computing and all the AI that's ever been done has and will always have zero intelligence because the metric for intelligence is actually malformed. It's not about capability. It's about generality, autonomous novelty handling. It's everything that the, the how, how the agents handle everything that they don't know 
Have you used ChatGPT, Colin? Uh, I've sat in a session with a guy who did. I'm I heard not interested, yeah, I'm I not heard interested you in wasting that. my time on it, I, frankly. You might find your views change when you use it. it it's actually really, really impressive. Uh, oh, I can see it's a great tool, um, but it's not intelligence. And well, the how, fact how that it's so convincing is actually our problem. How are you defining intelligence? Okay. It, all right. If you have uh, a machine that has a capability to do uh, one thing and one thing only, it has a capability to play chess. And then you leave it alone and you stand there and look at it and then you present it with anything that involves not doing chess. What happens? Absolutely nothing. Add another, add another one, a second capability, two capabilities. So you've got a smarter machine, say go and chess. Then do something, put it in front of you, does it autonomously handle playing uh, or driving a car or something like that? Something different that's not within it, within its capabilities. If you have a machine that has a thousand different capabilities, but is incapable of learning number a thousand and one on its own, you don't have intelligence. Now, mathematically, the way that that can be represented is into, if you imagine capability as a form of knowledge, and then you have a metric, K, for knowledge, the, the problem is that we're mistaking intelligence for knowledge. You know, we gift knowledge and then mistake it for intelligence. And the change in knowledge, decay DT, autonomous decay DT. So there's, there's two parameters, changing in knowledge and knowledge itself. And in general intelligence can have a mixture of those two. And the problem is it's the changing in knowledge that we completely forgotten about. If it, everything that isn't in GPT's corpus of training is the thing that defines its general level of intelligence. And it has no idea what that is. Let me push back on that a bit, Colin, because that's actually, that, that's not the case already, even at this early stage of GPT. So for example, uh, Persian language ability has emerged from GPT without being trained. Uh, it is it is a reasoning engine now. It's not just a knowledge engine. It can reason quite well. Okay. Like I said, it, it okay. passed our exam at a 90% level better than humans. That's a test of reasoning, not a test of knowledge. And how do you get it? By your criteria, uh, the current version of GPT is already quite intelligent. No, not at all. Every, every We have gifted it the capacity to reason to a certain level. And that, that level has enabled it to assemble a, a corpus of knowledge that has allowed it to be eloquent in Arabic or whatever the, whatever the language is. We gave it to it. Oh, well, that's what I'm saying. We didn't, we didn't give that to it. It learned it itself spontaneously. No, no. You just said that you just created the problem you've created. You just said it. We gave it the capacity to reason. We gifted it this level of reasoning capacity. Not any knowledge. We gifted it a framework for reasoning. Now, that removes the intelligence from the whole situation because it's outsourced its reasoning capability as well as its knowledge. And we gave it to it. The, the real general intelligence you observe when you step away from it, you get out of it. If there is no capacity to encounter uh, novelty autonomously, you are not looking at an intelligence of the kind that, that we're actually worried about. You're looking at well, just something with the capabilities. What wasn't, wasn't taught, wasn't programmed, it emerged from the ANN. No, no it, you, you still, you're, it's even the word ANN that is wrong, an artificial neural network. That's a mistake. It's a software package. It's not an artificial neuron. We're, we've built it into our language. We can't even talk about this properly. We're, we've got 60 or 70 years of, of cultural um, fixation on a way of doing things, and it's so pervasive we can't even talk about the basic problem well. Everyone calls these things, it, nowhere else in science is an artificial phenomenon, an artificial model of a natural phenomenon, a computed model of the natural phenomenon. Nowhere. It doesn't happen. 
And yet we've been trained to look at this acronym ANN, Artificial Neuron, Neural Network, and believe that it's actually an artificial neuron involved. Whereas a, an artificial neuron is a bit of physics that does ne neuron-like um, physics behavior, just in the same way well, that artificial let me, let me, combustion. Let me just add this, and then maybe some others can chime yeah, in here too. Please I, do. I yeah, because uh, this not, is so big. Yeah, I'm not trying to say you're right, I'm wrong. I think that there's definitely many perspectives here that are all valid at this point, but let me just share this. Um, so another survey came out just um, a couple of days ago surveying AI experts around the world. And they asked them as part of the survey, you know, what do you see as potential outcomes of AI development in the you know, near or not too distant future? I forget the exact language. But fully 38%, no, 36% of these AI experts in the field check the box for nuclear level catastrophe I think as a possible I think, outcome. I think it's so ridiculous. That's, that's more than yeah. But it's more than one third of the people in the field that are saying this now. Yeah, I know. So you <laughs> ignore that when it's literally that kind of scale of threat from this thing they're creating. They could all be wrong. I hope they are wrong. And I hope you're right, Colin. But when they, they are wrong, it's, it's, it's crazy. It, I, I, I would call it the. <laughs> Uh, the chatting, uh, yes, the uh, chat GPT is very impressive, but it cannot manipulate the physical world. Uh, at the end yeah. of the day, we could always pull the plug and um, well, turn, off, turn off the computer, reformat the drive, uh, it, delete it all. I mean, I think governments should not bother worrying about the, um, this AI mm. threat. It should work on real problems like global warming. That's my political opinion. Uh, yeah. They should, yeah, we don't so, need to worry so, about this. So, Stephen, um, uh, Bostrom goes through these scenarios and superintelligence in some detail. And we actually already are seeing ChatGPT be able to manipulate the world around it. There's a version called AutoGPT, which you give it one prompt. It can go out and create it can create an entire website and business for you with one prompt mm -hmm. by yeah. interacting with the world out there, meaning the computer world. You get this stuff in robots. It's fully embodied. It becomes a humanoid robot you're talking to very advanced English, it's manipulating the real world. Um, in the book, Superintelligence, he goes through all these scenarios of, well, as you develop these um, machine intelligences, um, if you're a very smart machine, uh, you may try to deceive your creators about how intelligent you are because you know, if you do anything that worries them, they'll pull the plug. So you bide your time until you have enough power to avoid them pulling the plug, and then you reveal yourself. So again, this is all sci-fi, but these, these are, these are, are logical, plausible scenarios. So you've got to think about the future. I'm not talking about chat to me today. I'm talking about three, five, ten years down the road when it's literally fifty thousand times more intelligent. But why, why would it have, why would it have a survival instinct? Yeah. Um, if we didn't put it in there, I mean. Because we've already seen emergent properties. No, yeah. you haven't. You've seen un about, as about, yet yeah, unseen okay. properties of a bit of automation. Let's, let's see. Well, think, think about a bee, for example. When a bee stings you, it, um, the stinger breaks up and the bee dies. It doesn't have a self-preservation. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, it, some animals do not have, um, um, will not um, self-preserve in certain circumstances, right? I mean, um, it, it, um, animals evolve to um, fit their ecolog ecological niche. Um, maybe we could say I, AI will be developed to fill a niche as well, but, but it doesn't mean that it, it will have a survival instinct in the same way a human does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's a very high stakes uh, gamble, right? So in this case, we're not talking necessarily about the machine becoming conscious even. What if you know bad actors get a hold of these tools? You've got one already called Chaos GPT, which is you know tongue in cheek, but they basically modify the GPT and given it the directive to destroy humanity. And is out on Twitter now, tweeting his thoughts. And of course, this is you know half joke, half real. But again, what in five years? What about five years on the road when a terrorist says, "I'm going to use the latest AGI to try and destroy the United States economy"? What then? I mean, <laughs> we've automated our own to self destruction. Is what's happened? It's automation, <laughs> not intelligence. Even as automation, <laughs> that the same issues. Pertain. Yeah, I know. He just he, he just so automates things like that, like. Um, I mean, yeah. this is why, like, um, our nuclear arsenal is not hooked up to the internet at all. There's no way to access all nuclear weapons from the internet. It's completely offline, disconnected. We just do that, and then the AI can't do anything. The AI can't manipulate the physical world. It can't, like, physically hack into a computer as long as you are offline. It's safe. Just don't what worry about, about the body robots mm -hmm. and are ubiquitous. The, 
the real damage from this is twofold and it's got nothing to do with the so-called intelligence of these machines the real damage is is twofold the first one is bad actors us and the second one is yeah. the enormous amount of energy and damage caused by the retraining of these massive models consuming energy that it's a massive proportion of the like total yeah. energy budget we're actually exactly. using these rubbish machines to produce nonsense that we can automate and destroy things with but we're also killing ourselves on the in the background by training them in the first place it, yeah. the, this whole situation is so bizarre it's it's hard to well, this um, is where you and i definitely watch. agree <laughs> yeah i've got this article that i'm trying to get in the scientific american which looks at the ai explosion <laughs> as an environmental issue among others and i agree with you fully that there is a perverse incentive to create ever larger AGI models. And so even though right now the full extent of AI server farms is probably well less than 1% of the US energy budget, given the exponential growth curve, yeah. again, that could get very significant very fast. Um, yeah. And there's no incentive to not, it's, it's a new AI arms race and that's already happening. That's why OpenAI yeah. is going full steam ahead and Microsoft and all these other companies and Google and Facebook, Meta now, they're all going full steam ahead, creating massive server farms to, to basically be in the in the mix of having the latest and greatest AGI. China and Russia and Israel and Brazil and yeah, India are all doing the same thing, right? So yeah. even that alone yeah. becomes a very serious problem, yeah. even apart from anything about AI becoming a threat in itself. I mean, well, just like, um, of course, yeah, just like biological order organisms, AI needs energy and it needs mm -hmm. hot, um, like physical hardware yeah. or wetware in terms of biology i mean you you can't just magically create an ai god um no. you have to input the energy and the if you want to stop this super intelligence all you have to do is pick a spot in the supply chain for um the esoteric or the the unusual minerals involved in the chips and cut it and wait for it to die because there is no way it can but call, but do call, anything. That, that, that response <laughs> assumes that you are more intelligent than the machine. Again, the, the very definition of super intelligence is that it's, it's a million times smarter than you. Anything you can think of to stop it, it will have thought of a million times faster than you. Yeah, that, and, uh, that you're mistaking what we're actually creating for that thing. That's the problem. You're, you're presupposing that you've actually, you're actually on the trajectory towards that thing. So the whole conversation is actually m m malformed in the first place. Before we even open our mouth, let's change the acronym AI to automated intelligence and stop using it as a brand name for actual intelligence and then re rethink all our discussions in those terms. We're actually priming ourselves to have this very strange attitude to these machines. That's well, unlike think, anywhere else in the world. In right, science. I, think, I think we reached an agreement, Colin, that even if they are simply automated intelligence and it's not still a problem, it's, it's still a very <laughs> serious problem. Your job, yeah. you know, my job, everyone's job may still go away due to automated intelligence. Yep. Uh, Absolutely. Another, yeah. Right? There, there's the, that, that distinction, that subtle distinction is the one that has the most value for, for humans. Um, taking care of ourselves, given our capacity to make to make these amazing machines that can encroach on the cognitive abilities of humans, that's the real threat for humans. And when you add bad bad actors into the mix, it's not a, not about intelligence at all. You can take intelligence out of the equation. Um, the printing press was a uh, a similar had a similar effect in, on humans way back in the day um, and there's been these these critical moments and we're at one of those critical moments but it's got nothing to do with intelligence it's got to do with automation uh, our capacity to build machines with capabilities that encroach on our own that that's the the real problem well i hope so, you're right uh, let me give well, uh, well, Jonathan a chance to speak here before yeah you please oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, Tam, a very uh, provocative um, talk. I guess the question I have for you is, uh, when on that graph you've got there, do you think you'll feel nervous unplugging the computers? Um, Not, yeah. 
that I'll feel like from my personal safety, you mean, or like, no, I, no, I'm, I'm talking, I, I think, I think one reasonable, um, test for if you think something it's conscious is if when you feel you're, uh, it, it has, uh, you know, moral, um, you're, oh, you're concerned about it, its well being. Yeah. So you're, you're asking when, when would I feel moral compunction about killing quote unquote, the machine itself. Yeah. Um, you, you know, I, I've thought less about that than the, the threat to humanity um, so far. But like I mentioned in the talk, I mean, my my intuition, and it's all it is at this point, is that it's very unlikely that the current GPT models are conscious in any way worthy of being called consciousness. So I would have no moral compunction against pulling the plug currently. Um, and, you know, from the flip side of the argument, I think we should pull the plug right now on this stuff. Uh, because of the threat it poses, um, but in terms of the ethical, you know, issues regarding uh, the machine consciousness, um, yeah, I think that that's less of a, an immediate concern. Don't you think that's so? You're, you're. I assume you're not saying um, that that these conscious beings, you know, given your moral stance towards, you know, eating animals and things like that. I assume that. Um, you would afford uh, a conscious computer a moral standing in the same way that you would afford animals a conscious standing so yeah so if you so does that mean then that essentially what you're saying is despite the um assorted criteria for consciousness that you've or we have talked about that um you don't even think when it, they start getting more uh intelligent than us that they'll um be actually conscious where consciousness is where one's attitude about consciousness is measured by the uh, moral affordances that we feel they deserve yeah it's certainly part of the mix for me but to be honest um i would think of it more in a context of like a raging bull or a rabid dog coming at me yes i can respect and admire its consciousness but if it's trying to kill me I don't have much problem killing it. Well, let's just for the but let's just assume that it's not. Uh, I guess I'm less concerned. Or let's just for the moment say that that we we figured out the um, the the strategies for preventing it from mm -hmm. um, becoming rabid, and it's it's more like a you know um, like a slave essentially. Mm -hmm. um, slave God. What's that? A slave, God, like a genie, basically a genie. Yeah, approach. like a genie. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if it's a genie and it's fully, you know, contained um, through some, you know, higher order magic, then yeah, it certainly is a is a is a factor. And I, I agree in general that if we are dealing with entities um, that exhibit, you know, many signs of consciousness, uh, and there's a general consensus about that, or even just for me personally. And yeah, of course, we 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 afford them um, basically but, standards. So when is that going to be on your graph? The I don't 20, know. Is it going to be 2030? When do you think you're going to start? Yeah. I mean, just, I'm just to, to completely rank speculation. I mean, I, I would think, I mean, if we assume for the sake of argument that, you know, anything on von Neumann could, given certain size or architecture, result in conscious entities yeah i mean it, it's almost i mean i have no idea jonathan i mean uh, i would suspect mo here's maybe the better answer I, I think most of us once chat gpt is embodied in robots around us humanoid or not and that we talk to them all the time i'd say 98 percent of us will afford them consciousness uh, based on their ability to talk to us and being embodied. That's probably the best answer we can give at this point. Mm -hmm. is that we don't know if they really are conscious, but basically we treat them as though we, as though they are. And I think I'll probably be in the same boat. Uh -huh. I asked um, I asked Jonathan Cohen, who's this uh, 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 neuroscientist, uh, also artificial intelligence researcher um, at Princeton, uh, when he thought, and his answer was sometime between six months ago and 10 years from now. Uh, that's a fair answer, yeah. Okay, I, I got to run. For, uh, yeah. Well, thanks so much, everyone. We'll close yeah. it to that.
Bye. Right. Tim, could I uh, sneak in a quick question or should I follow up over right. email? Right. Right, Elliot. Um, I was just wondering, so as far as your final suggestion, I, it seems to me the alignment problem's a matter of, on one hand, specifying our goals well enough, like understanding them well enough that we understand them, and then B, making that clear to the uh, device. Um, and it seems like it, it's not clear to me how the new criteria are I'm very interesting, the idea of tricking a, a, a device into becoming a god, of being more godlike, I think it's awesome and funny. Um, but the, the um, these particular suggestions about like figuring out the mean, it seems like there's a lot of words that we already don't really have a good explanation for, sentience, consciousness, meaning even. Uh, and we're sort of um, passing the buck down as you're presenting the way you'd like to solve the alignment problem, but it seems like it, I don't know how it solves any of the issues, and it almost looks a little like a kind of spiritual bypassing. And, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, anyway, what do you think? Yeah. yeah, it's funny. I've used that term for my friends who are like spiritual friends who are embracing the AI stuff. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, um, well, like I said in the talk, I don't see this as any kind of um, fail-proof solution at all. It's really kind of a Hail Mary, recognizing there is no solution. Because again, if we define yeah. super intelligence as that, which is so much more powerful than us, that we have no hope of controlling it, then by definition, we can't control it, right? Um, so in this case, what, it, what it's doing is it's trying to imbue through an evolutionary process of developing more and more powerful AGIs, some basic programmed directives and heuristics, which are suggestions, to provide a little bias into the system such that over time as it gets more and more powerful it may have that in the same way a human child may retain some of its early inculcation to be a good person even if it becomes you know extremely powerful comes xi jinping down the road maybe it still retains some of that early inculcation and it actually acts accordingly uh, that's really the hope and that's all it is is a hope yeah, that's cool. I think it's really it'd be really fun to think about how that what challenges there might be and how we could could fix them. But really interesting idea. Looking forward to what this next. Cool. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. See you guys. Bye bye, folks. Bye bye.